All right, and we are live. How are you, Justin? I'm doing great, Shadi. Thanks for having me on today. I am very happy. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to have uh, this talk. Today I have with me one of the best grapplers on the planet and one of the best teachers uh, on the planet and of our generation, Justin Flores. You might know him. Uh, I've known him as Ronda's coach, a BJJ black belt, and one of the most superb judokas of the 2000s. Um, he had mastered perfectly the holy trinity of grappling, wrestling, BJJ, and judo. And today, I hope we can take a lot from this conversation. Justin, welcome. Thank you for the intro. Um, honor to be here with you and to uh, share some of my experiences and knowledge and, and kind of pass some of that forward here. And of course, I forgot the creator of JFlow Judo, the yes. online academy. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first, uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions about uh, yourself, particularly your competitive career when it, came to, when it came to the Olympics, you know, going up to the highest of levels, you know, someone being having medals on the international stage, continental, and of course, the, the national stage. Um, in late 2020, I had a talk with Shintaro Higashi. Um, he was talking about you. Um, he was showing so much admiration and respect. Uh, is this a Paris Saint-Germain mug? Yeah, it is. That's my team. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This conversation was destined for greatness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, Shintaro was talking about, you know, you being like this very well-rounded grappler, being very talented, swift, fighting like a shadow almost. But he says that, you know, this guy is definitely going to the Olympics. This guy is going to be one of the greatest uh, on the Olympic stage. But, you know, due to many problems, he never went there. And it was like a re it's it's almost like the story of a tragic hero in a sense. So if you care to talk a little bit more about your road to the Olympics, what happened in the 2000s? Sure, sure. Yeah. And that means a lot coming from Shintaro, who's a great grappler himself, a, a wrestler, a high level wrestler, high level judoka and now a jiu-jitsu practitioner himself. Um, he has an eye for things himself. Um, but yeah, going back, um, my father was um, a sort of mad scientist where he's a doctor and he um, looked at myself and my brother as like almost an experiment out of a lab to create like the perfect uh, combat athlete, uh, judoka. He's a black belt in like seven different uh, martial arts from ranging from Iaido, Kendo, Japanese Jiu Jitsu, Judo, Karate. Um, so he he took it upon himself to have me and my brother start in gymnastics from a young age to get our balance and proprioception coordination to become uh, like just understanding movement harmoniously before we entered into like a, a discipline such as Judo. And then we started in jump roping after that. We actually were on a traveling jump roping team that would go to different cities and do demonstrations at Disneyland and go to competitions out of the state of California. And we became really proficient with footwork and court and uh, cardio. So from then, when we were, I was eight, nine years old, my brother was nine, 10 years old. He's a year and a half older than me. We started in judo. And even though I'm, I'm right-handed, he, he started us as left-handed judoka because, wow. um, because his assumption and the understanding, most people are right-handed. So they lead with their right foot and they, their power hand is their right hand. And to be kind of orthodox would make us normal. So we wanted to be a little unconventional. So we started as lefties. And um, that's how we, we grew up doing judo. Uh, so he, he had this whole laid out approach of how to, to get us to do different techniques where he numbered a system from one to 99. One is Seonagi, two is Uchimata, three is Ochigari, four is Taitoshi, and so on and so forth, all the way to 99. And he would use these codes when coaching us from the mat side or during practice. And some of them were like Neiwaza stall. Some of them were Marote Gari, double leg. Just a, a whole different way of kind of going about thinking it and structuring the sport. Um, so my brother and I kind of grew up as it was kind of strange compared to the normal guy next door who's surfing and skateboarding. 
Yeah. Um, so we grew up really, really successful in judo, um, in juniors and, and winning junior nationals and to the junior Pan American and junior world. Um, we, we grew up in the, the top tier of athletes, um, combat athletes doing judo. And then as we moved to senior ranks, um, I was the number one at 60 kilograms at um, 1997. I was 17. And my brother was the number one at 66 kilograms, and he was 19. And we, um, I saw the writing on the wall. I was no longer going to be able to make 60 kilograms. So I decided to accept a wrestling scholarship to the University of Nebraska. And um, I, I just I knew I wouldn't be able to l make three more years of 60 kilograms. So um, – after that, that quad, the 2000 quad finished, I went back to judo. I, I left two years early from college wrestling, and I kind of picked off right where I left um, judo. Um, but I had a little bit more of a, a struggle because I missed a very important gap of um, development, that like 18 to 20, 17 to 20 range, where a lot of the athletes, the judoka from, from around the world that I was beating – we're now meddling at the world championships and winning these big tournaments. When I was competing in those tournaments later, uh, I just couldn't find my way into the top seven. There was just too many miles that they were able to cover that I, you know, I was in a different sport, which in the long run was probably a good thing. But in my development at that time, it, it definitely hindered me. I wasn't beating our Sibia anymore. I wasn't Ehud Vox from Israel who I'd beaten. These people were kind of jumped me. So I had a lot of work to make up and ground to cover, which I did. And um, leading into the 2004 Olympics, um, I had fought Alex Atiano, who had uh, gone to the Olympics in 2000. Uh, I'd fought him like nine or ten times and I had beaten the majority of those times. But I'd struggled with knee injuries. I had uh, three ACL reconstructions between 2000 and 2004. I so um, I would I would get a big surgery, do my rehab, come back, have great results, and then get injured again on my other knee. So it was this cycle that I had to deal with, and it was really hard um, psychologically to to stay positive and to just be motivated. And my weight would yo-yo up and down, and uh, it just it was a big challenge. I had to kind of reevaluate what I was doing with my life a lot of times and find self-worth in other areas rather than just winning, whether the ref points my direction or the other direction. So it was humbling. And it kind of, at times was, I felt like I had total despair. I didn't have anything. I, I left college, so I didn't have a college degree. I was moved back home. So I didn't have my own like I don't know, material goods. I didn't have my own place to live. I was, I felt way behind the bell curve in modern capitalism, so to speak, for this dream, which was, you know, before my very eyes was, was getting taken away from me because of these injuries. So uh, I, I was able to kind of get back to good shape right before the 2004 Olympic trials. And I was the number two seed, even though I had beaten Alex multiple times, um, more than he'd beat me. He had a, an A-level ranking. Uh, he mm -hmm. medaled in Korea, the Korean Open at the time. Um, he beat Yosef Kernak, who took silver at those Olympics for bronze. And he got his A standard. And I was only B standard, so I had to go into the Olympic trials. And I had to beat him in the finals to force a two out of three playoff. Mm -hmm. And in that tournament of five... I made the finals and so did Alex and I beat him. So it forced the two out of three playoff. And then I beat him the first match. And then in the second match, I lost a Shido. So mm. it went to the last match to see who qualifies for the Olympic team. And in like the first 30 seconds, I came in for kind of like a, a Yoko Sutemi uh, lats dump. And what um, about today, the new Kataguruma? Exactly. And when I came in for that attack, Alex turned away from me. And the way we landed in a really funny angle, um, my head spiked the mat and I was concussed. And I had, at the time, I had a really bad neck and I still do. Um, a couple herniated discs from just landing on my head wrong to spin out of throws, just kind of the old school way to get uh, so that no score would happen. Um, and I, it was like a flash knockout. And um, the doctor got called onto the mat and he grazed my gi with his hand 
And at that point, I was disqualified. And I, I didn't know it. I stood up, and after I kind of came to, sure, things were foggy, but the ref had given Alex the win. So mm -hmm. at that point, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of hard to deal with for, for a long time. Just being right there in the moment to make the Olympic team, which had been my, you know, lifelong dream. And I felt deserving of that um, title and to be able to compete and represent my country. Lo and behold, you know, it didn't happen for me at that, at that moment. Um, and I had to kind of grapple with the fact that, you know, do I want to get back on the horse and do it again? I, I have to kind of clean up my life as far as I got to, I got to still go to school. I got to finish my degree. I need to, to maybe move away from what I was comfortable with and, and try something new if I was going to do this again. So it took a while. It took a good eight, nine months to kind of reevaluate things and um, try and find some semblance of self-worth to, to do it. And I did. And I got back on the horse and um, I moved from Southern California to the Bay Area um, to like San Francisco, San Jose area. And I just kind of made my own team. I, I, I kind of put things together. It's, it was kind of difficult because, you know, there's not that many places you can go in the U.S. to get like a one-stop shop. Everything you need from strength and conditioning, dietary and nutrition um, expertise, judo training itself. Um, none of that. It's just you got to piecemeal it together. So for that next quad, I kind of did that. And I had probably the most successful results in a two to three year span as I had the prior quad, even though I'd done some pretty uh, good results in that quad. Um, so I tried some different things, you know, that were a little bit unconventional. I, I started jujitsu, training jujitsu when it wasn't as popular. Um, I went back and trained wrestling as a cross training because this is back in the day when you could grab legs and kind of do pickups. So Tegarumas and Fireman's Carries were, were part of the game. So, um, and usually strategically I'd use those techniques against like Japanese players or, or Japanese style players. I would kind of grovel, so to speak. And against like European, Eastern European Russians, I'd use Japanese judo. So it was good to kind of have those two balances. And I would wrestle at Stanford University and cross train with this guy named Matt Gentry who wrestled for the bronze medal in the 2008 Olympics. We were kind of training partners in wrestling, even though I wasn't wrestling. And then I would train at San Jose State Judo program. At the time, had a, a lot of good uh, bodies my weight. So I, would be, I was enrolled in school to finish my degree at a Menlo College. And I would go to school, and then I would fly to Europe, and then I would come back for class, and I would fly to Japan, I'd come back for class. So it was a very, um, you know busy time. I would live out of my bag most, most weeks. Um, and leading into the 2008 Olympics, I had qualified the division through the Pan Am region. You have to be in the top six at the time. And uh, the Pan Am region at my era was, was really a difficult weight class. You had, I think, five or six uh, judoka from the Pan Am region who had placed in the top seven at the Worlds or Olympics. So you had Joao Durley, a two-time world champion. Your Andes are in Sibia, a two-time Olympic medalist. You had um, Ludwig Ortiz from Venezuela, top seven in the world championships. Sasha Medvedevich, top seven at the world championships. And um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple others, but it, it was really deep, the weight class. So fighting for a medal was a success at that time. Um, so I qualified in the top five at the, of the Pan Am. And then going into 2008, I started having a really hard time with my body. Just the number of knee surgeries I had accrued to that point was 15 or 20. Uh, scopes, um, knee ligament replacements from my uh, MCL, PCL, ACLs. And it was getting really difficult to be able to maintain my weight in a way that it didn't carry into my match because it used to be morning of weigh-ins. So I'd weigh in at 6 a.m. and have my first match at 9 a.m. So it would be hard to recover in time to function to a high level in the first match or two. So my body was kind of starting to tell me like, you know, this is, this is getting too much to make 66 kilos twice a month and to function at a level that I was used to functioning at. So my results really dropped off. 
and it was hard to maintain the style of judo that I felt was my best way of winning. So I was starting to depend on other things like counters or just Nawaza. And my results really did suffer. And I, I went into the Olympic trials as a lower seed and I, I lost to someone I'd never lost to. And they ended up going to the Olympics, Taylor Takata. I'd beat him maybe four or five times leading into that tournament. So it was just kind of a, a downward progression in my results. And it was hard psychologically to, to kind of like the best results are behind me, you know, like I'm 28 at the time. I felt like I owed myself another quad after 2004, even though definitely athletically and my judo was best then. I wasn't as cerebral, but I didn't have so much like analysis paralysis going on mid-match where the older I got, the more I was second guessing myself and I almost getting in my own way. So it was kind of like I was my own worst enemy leading into the end where I should have been the most confident and and looking back, you know, I understand why. It's just I would have done some different things, definitely. But it all happened for a reason. Like, I, I, I have no one to blame. I, I left it all on the mat. I, I tried where I could the best. And some other things I probably should have done a little different. But that's just high in science 2020. And now as a coach, I feel like I could relate to my athletes a lot better knowing the struggles I went through to be able to help maybe in the process for either these judoka athletes, wrestling athletes, or mixed martial arts fighters that I, I coach and train.